Okay, so let's now talk about functions of hormones. Let's look at the first function, which is they control cellular metabolism, growth, and division. In other words, they stimulate mitosis. So examples of hormones that do this are human growth hormone and thyroid hormones, T3 and T4, something that we're going to look at later. The second function is they stimulate synthesis of enzymes and or other proteins. So a good example would be your steroid hormones as well as T3 and T4, your thyroid hormones. The third function is they control bodily fluids and electrolyte balance. So examples of these hormones would be ADH, your antidiuretic hormone, and aldosterone. They control the secretion of other hormones. So examples of these would be your hypothalamic releasing hormone and your hypothalamic inhibiting hormone, something that we will talk about in detail later on. Another function is they regulate reproductive cycles. So examples of these would be your steroids, testosterone, progesterone, estrogen. The last function is they regulate homeostasis by negative or positive feedback loop. So examples would be insulin and glucagon. So these two hormones regulate blood glucose levels. So let's now discuss the types of hormones. We're going to begin with the amino acid derivatives, or in other words, derived from amino acids, specifically tyrosine and tryptophan. So tyrosine and tryptophan are two of the 20 amino acids. When tyrosine and tryptophan are modified, they will give us what we refer to as monoamines or biogenic amines. Examples that are derived from tyrosine and tryptophan are epinephrine, neuroepinephrine, dopamine, melatonin, histamine, serotonin, our thyroid hormones T3 called triiodothyronine, and T4, tetraiodothyronine, or simply thyroxin. The second type of hormones are what we refer to as peptide hormones. So examples of peptide hormones are your glycoprotein. So they consist of more than 200 amino acids all linked together via peptide bonds. And they're referred to as glycoproteins is because they have an associated carbohydrate side chain. Examples of these hormones are your thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH, your luteinizing hormone, LH, your follicle stimulating hormone, FSH. We also have what we call short or small peptides. So they consist of less than 200 amino acids. Examples of these hormones are antidiuretic hormone, ADH, oxytocin, growth hormone, prolactin, and insulin. The last type of hormones are derived from lipids. So we have what we call eicosanoids, which is derived from a fatty acid called arachidonic acid. Examples of these are leukotrienes. So leukotrienes are involved in inflammatory response. So prostaglandins uh, has been implicated in the pain and discomfort of uh, menstruation because what they do is they stimulate uterine contraction. In other words, the muscles of the uterus uh, begin to contract under the influence of prostaglandins. Thromboxanes, which are released by your activated platelets, are involved in hemostasis, the coagulation that we talked about earlier. We then have what are called steroids, which are all derived from cholesterol. So cholesterol is one of the types of lipids. Our examples are androgens, testosterone, for example, your estrogens, estradiol, progesterone, glucocorticoids, cortisol as an example, mineral corticoids, aldosterone as an example, and calcitriol. Please note, I'm not expecting you to memorize these hormones as far as what type of hormones they are classified as. So for example, if I say dopamine, I'm not going to expect you to know that it's an amino acid derivative. However, what I do want you to know are these amino acid derivative hormones, most of them are all derived from a modified tyrosine. The only exception would be the hormone melatonin, right? So out of all this amino acid derivatives, melatonin is the only one that is derived from a modified tryptophan. So everything else, what you see, examples that are given here, they're all derived from tyrosine. So if you just memorize melatonin, and then I ask you on the exam, serotonin, it's an amino acid derivative of what amino acid? So your answer should be tyrosine, because if you just memorize melatonin, and it's the only one that's from a derived tryptophan. So hopefully that will make it easy. Now what about your T3 and T4, your thyroid hormones? Ladies and gentlemen, this too I need you to know. 
All right? So I do need you to know what T3 means, triiodothyronine, and T4, tetraiodothyronine, also known as thyroxine. So your thyroid hormones are derived from tyrosine. All right, now what about your peptide hormones? I'm not going to expect you to memorize the list of glycoproteins, much less the short or small proteins. It's, it's too much. Now, what about the lipids? I do want you to know the steroids, all right? So definitely know the list of those steroid hormones, and they're all derived, once again, from cholesterol. So before we move on to the next slide, I do just want to point out one last thing. So if we bracket number one and two, we're going to say these are all protein derived. All right. So all protein derived, because we know that amino acids obviously are building blocks of protein. So if you memorize the steroids, all right, and you know the list of steroids, but again, I need you to memorize these. And if I give you, let's say, antidiuretic hormone you know that ADH is not one of the steroids because you were asked to memorize the steroid. So if I ask you, okay, what is ADH as far as the type of hormone? Well, then your answer should be it's a protein-derived hormone. Another example, if I say, all right, how about calcitriol? All right, this hormone right over here, calcitriol, which is the active form of vitamin D3. And I ask you, tell me, calcitriol, active form of vitamin D3, what is it derived from? Well, then you should be answering that it's a lipid-derived hormone. Specifically, it's a steroid hormone derived from cholesterol. So I went ahead and broke down the types of hormones in a more of a layout fashion, sort of like a flow chart, uh, in the hopes that it will make more sense by doing it this way. So let's just point a few things out. And again, I'll emphasize what you need to know. So we know we have the amino acid derivatives. All right, so right here, and here is your tyrosine, and here's your tryptophan. So I ask you to know that melatonin is derived from the amino acid tryptophan. In addition, I also want you to know T3 and T4, triiodothyronine and tetraiodothyronine T4, or also known as thyroxine. And we have our peptides, your glycoproteins, and your short, small peptides. We also said in the last slide, that we're going to bracket these two, and these are referred to as your protein-derived hormones. And then, of course, we have our lipid-derived hormones. You have your eicosanoids and your steroids, right? And as I said, I need you to memorize the different types of steroids. Bottom line, they're all derived from the lipid cholesterol. So if we look at the cholesterol, we have your vitamin D3 active form called calcitriol. We have what we call your gonadal steroids, all right, which I will explain later. So these gonadal steroids, that means they come from the gonads. So you need to think testes and ovaries, all right? So testes in males, ovaries in females. So these gonadal steroids are your testosterone, your estrogen, and your progesterone. Then we have what are called adrenocortical steroids. Now, the reason why they're called adrenocortical steroids is because they're produced by the adrenal cortex, which is part of the adrenal gland, all right? Something that we'll look at later. So what are these adrenocortical steroids? Well, one of which is testosterone, all right? So the adrenocortical steroids include testosterone. So therefore, is testosterone made not only in the gonads, but they're also made in the adrenal cortex of the adrenal gland? The answer is yes. All right, another example of adrenocortical steroids are your mineral corticoids. In other words, aldosterone. Another example of the adrenocortical steroids are your glucocorticoids. In other words, cortisol. All right, so please, again, I need you to know the list of these steroids. The last thing we'll look at before we move on, whether or not these hormones are water-soluble or lipid-soluble. So let me write that down. Water soluble versus lipid. Water soluble versus lipid soluble. So I hope you know what it means to be water soluble, meaning they're able to interact with water. They're hydrophilic. Then we have the lipid soluble hormones, which is the opposite. They cannot interact with water. Therefore, they're hydrophobic. So what I did is I went ahead and highlighted in yellow the lipid-soluble hormones. So 
What are we looking at here? We're looking at T3 and T4. Your thyroid hormones, your triiodothyronine, and your T4, your tetraiodothyronine, or thyroxine, are actually hydrophobic. They are lipid-soluble hormones. The next category of hormones that are lipid-soluble are your steroids. All of them, all derived from cholesterol, all of them are hydrophobic. They are lipid-soluble. So then what about the rest? What about the rest of the peptides and melatonin, epinephrine, norepinephrine? Well, all of those are water-soluble, so they are hydrophilic. So please memorize the lipid-soluble hormones. You're already being asked to know the steroids, and you know T3 and T4 is one of the lists you need to know. So it's a process of elimination, right? So if I say insulin, is insulin a lipid-soluble or water-soluble hormone? Well, your answer should be water-soluble because only your steroids in T3 and T4 are lipid-soluble. Now, what about the eicosanoids? This is what's interesting about the eicosanoids. They are derived from the fatty acid, arachidonic acid. They're lipids. However, these eicosanoids, they are not lipid-soluble. They are actually water-soluble. So before we begin discussing this slide, I just want to emphasize you are not expected to know the molecular or chemical structures of these compounds or these substances, All right? So please note, I'm not going to ask you to draw how these look like molecularly or chemically, All right? That's too much. It's beyond the scope of our class. All right, so this is just essentially just showing us the, uh, the steroids, the monoamines or biogenic amines, and the peptides that we looked at before. And I went ahead and broke down the steroids, your gonadosteroids produced by the gonads, and your adrenocortical steroids produced by the adrenal cortex of the adrenal gland. And over here are the eicosanoids, all derived from the fatty acid, arachidonic acid. And here is the breakdown of how we end up with our steroids, with our cholesterol-derived hormones. So I'm going to refer to this diagram that I did. All right? So steroids all derived from cholesterol. So the first one is calcitriol, which is the active form of vitamin D3. Now then we look at progesterone. All right? So progesterone. So progesterone will give us the following. It will give us testosterone. And from testosterone, it will then give us estrogen or estradiol. Progesterone will also give us the glucocorticoids. Cortisol is an example of one. Progesterone will also give us the mineral corticoids, an example of which is aldosterone. So really, our steroid hormones that we're familiar with, your estrogen, your testosterone, aldosterone, those are all derived from progesterone. So if we trace it back, however, it all stems from cholesterol. So I like this table because it will compare between the lipid and water-soluble hormones. So if we look at the lipid-soluble hormones, we have our steroid hormones and our thyroid hormones, T3 and T4. Remember, when it says lipid-soluble, meaning it's hydrophobic, it cannot interact with water. Then we have everything else. We have all amino acid-based hormones with the exception of T3 and T4, our thyroid hormones, as well as eicosanoids. So eicosanoids, of course, are lipid-derived, but remember, they are water-soluble. They're hydrophilic. So the sources of the lipid-soluble hormones, the adrenal cortex, the gonads, and as well as the thyroid glands. And what about the water-soluble? Practically all the other endocrine glands. Can they be stored in secretory vesicles? For lipid-soluble hormones, no. Well, what about the water-soluble hormones? Yes, they can. So in other words, your water-soluble hormones can be stored inside the cell. So under the appropriate stimulus or when the appropriate time arrives, then these water-soluble hormones will be then exocytosed by these endocrine glands. What about the transport in blood? Now remember, lipid-soluble hormones are not able to interact with water. And we know that plasma, the fluid part of blood, is mostly composed of water. So in order to transport these lipid-soluble hormones, they must be bound to some type of carrier, plasma proteins. So what are we looking at here? Well, we're looking at those alpha-beta globulins that we talked about before in blood. Albumin also is a transporter of these lipid-soluble hormones. Now, what about this water-soluble hormones? Well, because they're hydrophilic, they don't need to be bound to some type of carrier. So they're usually free in plasma. What about the half-life? 
So for now, I'll skip the discussion of Half-Life in Blood because I'll talk about Half-Life later on. All right, location of the receptors on their target cells. For lipid-soluble hormones, the location of the receptors are actually inside the cell, all right, which is what we're going to be looking at in the next few slides. Now, what about the location of receptors for the water-soluble hormones in their target cells? Well, their receptors will be actually on the plasma membrane. Mechanism of action at the target cell. Your lipid-soluble hormones, your steroids and T3 and T4, will actually activate genes. So they'll result in the synthesis of new proteins. Water-soluble hormones usually act through the secondary messenger system, which, by the way, we are not going to go over in this class. So let's now look at actions of hormones. Hormones act in two ways. It just depends upon whether it's a water-soluble hormone or a lipid-soluble hormone. So let's begin with the water-soluble hormones, your monoamines or your biogenic amine hormones, with the exception of your thyroid hormones, T3 and T4, as well as your peptide hormones and eicosanoids. So how do they work on their target cell? Well, what they first have to do is bind to plasma membrane receptors. All right, so the location of the receptors on their target cell for water-soluble hormones literally is on the plasma membrane of the cell. That's why they're referred to as having plasma membrane receptors. They utilize the secondary messenger system. As I previously said, we are not going to look at how this works, all right? There's just simply not enough time. So what I just need you to know, that water-soluble hormones will bind to plasma membrane receptors that are present on their target cell. Another thing I also need you to remember is these water-soluble hormones cannot enter their target cell, all right? So they will remain extracellularly. Now, what about the lipid-soluble hormones, your steroid hormones and your thyroid hormones, T3 and T4? Well, they bind to intracellular receptors. So we'll see that in the next slide. So these are just essentially two images showing us the water-soluble hormones, which is right over here. So they use glucagon and prolactin as an example. And take note of the membrane-bound receptors. All right, so these are plasma membrane receptors that are present on the target cell. So let's now look at our lipid-soluble hormones, your steroid hormones and T3 and T4. So we have this steroid hormone here, and take note how this steroid hormone diffuses into the cell. So in other words, it just literally passes through that plasma membrane like it weren't even there. All right, then once the steroid hormone has entered the cytoplasm of the cell, here is its receptor, right? It's intra cellular receptor. So now what do we end up having? We have a receptor hormone complex. So this is where now the steroid hormone has entered the cytoplasm, binds to the receptor protein, therefore making this cell the target cell for this specific steroid hormone. So then this complex enters the nucleus, right? Upon which it's going to bind to a segment on the gene, specifically called the promoter, although I'm not expecting you to know that. So once it binds to the gene or a part of the DNA that makes up that gene, it will initiate transcription. All right, so let me just step back for just a second and look at this illustration that I did on the right side. This is just a refresher memory of transcription and translation that I hope you discuss in 189. So here is our DNA, right? This is what our genes are made up of. So DNA will undergo transcription to give us messenger RNA, mRNA. That messenger RNA will leave the nucleus. Once it's in the cytoplasm or the cytosol, it will undergo translation, whereby we produce protein. So it goes from DNA, messenger RNA, protein. And this is essentially what our steroid hormones are going to do. Because of this, the effects of these lipid-soluble hormones sometimes cannot easily be undone. One last point before I move on is if we look at this particular image over here, here's our lipid-soluble hormone. It diffuses into the cell. And now that this lipid-soluble hormone is in the cytoplasm, sometimes the receptor is actually not found in the cytoplasm itself. So in other words, the receptor is inside the nucleus. So here is this lipid-soluble hormone. It enters the nucleus, upon which it binds to the receptor that this time is inside the nucleus itself.
Whatever the case may be, whether the receptor is in the cytoplasm or the receptor is in the nucleoplasm, in other words, inside the nucleus, the result is still the same. We will have transcription and eventually translation and will yield a protein. So this slide specifically shows us one of those lipid-soluble hormones, specifically T3 and T4, our thyroid hormones. So take note of what's happening here. Here's our T3, T4. It has entered the target cell. So we have two receptors as far as T3 and T4 is concerned. The first receptor is actually found in the mitochondria, the so-called powerhouse of that cell. And we already know what the role of the mitochondrion is. It's there to generate all that ATP when we're undergoing aerobic cellular respiration, assuming that we have oxygen. By binding to the receptor in the mitochondria, it will result in an increase in ATP production. And you'll see why this is later. The other receptor for T3 and T4 is found inside the nucleus. Therefore, T3 and T4 enters the nucleus, binds to the receptor found in the nucleus, and of course, we know what ends up happening. We produce messenger RNA, transcription, the messenger RNA to be translated into a protein.